Greetings, friends, and welcome back to Speaking Plainly. This is uh, part three, and I appreciate those of you who've been watching along with me and uh, walking through the scriptures and trying to figure out the heart of God. And that's really the purpose for this kind of thing. It really is to please our Lord, to get into the word and figure out what he's already commanded so that we can be pleasing to his heart and uh, prayerfully see revival and reformation in our land. First time up, we talked about the authority of scripture and how we really need to get back to the word of God. Friends, if I can be honest with you, there's a lot of people praying for revival and hoping for revival and doing stuff to try to create revival. But until we repent and go back to the principles and precepts and patterns of scripture, until we cry out to God and say, Lord, we're sorry for breaking your commands and doing it our way, then we just kind of, we're having church and praise God for having church, but, but we're just kind of spinning our wheels and we really do need to get back to the word of God. And uh, of course, everybody says that, but I have, uh, as many of you have probably figured out, saying that we need to go back to the word of God and actually going back to the word of God are two different things because saying it sounds good. We know we need to, going back requires effort, requires change. It requires uh, the ability to be uncomfortable. And our families and our churches might cost us some money, might even cost us relationships. And so, uh, and then complicating matters is the fact that we all come to these things at different times. And so I might see a thing that you may not see. Uh, and so that, that means that lots of mercy and grace and love is required uh, as well. So uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, but let's, let's get back to scripture and figure out God's heart and, uh, and trust him for those things that we cannot control as a result of our obedience. And that brings me to the topic for today. Let's see, as of, of this recording, it is July of 2019. And in May uh, of 2000, and oh my goodness, it's been five years ago, 13? Yeah, May of 2013, maybe 14, May of 2014, uh, five years ago, uh, I preached a message in our church on the, the time uh, honored uh, old school historic Christian doctrine of head covering. And um, why did I do that? You know, why would I, you know, open up that barrel of fish hooks? Well, because we were walking through First Corinthians uh, back in 2013. Uh, we felt like the Lord had called us to go line by line through that book. That's kind of how we do it at our church. Uh, probably 90% of the preaching is line by line through large sections of scripture. The idea is for people to really hear God's heart, to hear the whole counsel of God. And so we started in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1 in 2013, yeah. And by the time uh, May of 2014 had rolled around, we were on chapter 11. And honestly, uh, growing up, I had never heard that text preached. I never heard that text preached at all. And I soon found out why that text was avoided. Uh, because we, we did our best with it. We went line by line through it. We did research prior to it. For a couple of months, if I recall, I was working on it because I knew that it had a little heat attached to it. And it was something that was hard to understand for a lot of people in our day. And we rolled out the text. I'll put it in the description. That message is uh, probably the most watched message I've ever done uh, on YouTube anyway. But I'll put it in the description. I still believe everything that's in that message. Uh, but I wanted to kind of address it again, five years hence, um, you know, someone asked me after I preached it, well, how did the church respond? How did the church receive it? And I thought at the time, it seems like, okay. I mean, there's a few people that were kind of shaking their heads and some people had even told me that, wow, they had seen some things they had never seen before. Uh, and of course, um, this series of Speaking Plainly is for our local church more than anything else. But uh, and I said that to say, we didn't try to make anybody do anything. We didn't try to make the sisters cover their heads. Of course, men obey this principle, obey this doctrine anyway. Uh, and we actually enforce the doctrine on, on men and not just my church, but most churches, I would dare say just about all churches enforce this doctrine, Protestant churches anyway, enforce this doctrine uh, with the men where we, uh, we know that it's dishonorable and disrespectful for a man to pray and prophesy with his head covered. Uh, and we see that even out in the culture, whether it's the national anthem or whatever. So, so we didn't have to worry about the men's side of it, even though we do enforce it. Uh, but with the sisters, a little bit of hypocrisy here, but with the sisters, uh, we just said, hey, this is something new. This is something you probably never heard before. So, you know, you go back to your family and you guys figure it out. 
And that's kind of where we've been. And but even uh, though we didn't enforce it, we had a handful, a small handful of sisters decided that, wow, this is something that um, we need to obey and started covering. And because of the visual nature of the symbol, where you walk into our church and you see some sisters covered and some sisters not covered, I don't know, you, you can just imagine the spiritual dynamic that was unintentionally created where people had different thoughts and views about that. And I have to say five years hence, it hurt us in terms of attendance and so forth. I have to say that preaching that doctrine and then just moving on to the rest of chapter 11 and then chapter 12 and chapter 13 and onward through everything else we've taught since then um, to this day, it, it, um, it's a mark in our church where I look back and go, wow, we really changed since that one sermon. So what is this all about? What is the big deal here? You know, why does everyone get so upset over this very beautiful doctrine? Well, I think part of it is because we let it go. Like it was, it was historic from the time of the apostles to the 1950s or 60s or so. And with the women's movement and the liberalization of lots of the church, we just laid it down. Uh, and of course, so anyone trying to pick up something like that uh, because of the notoriety attached to it, because of the uh, stigma attached to it, that it's somehow oppressive or hurts women or something, I don't know. But uh, because of all of that, there's, there's, some, there's some, like as I said earlier, there's some heat attached to it. There's a, there's a stigma attached to it. And, and in my opinion, there's also some spiritual warfare attached to it as well. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think that that really is part of it. The other part of it is just lack of understanding, lack of understanding of what the passage is actually saying. And then maybe another part of it is just good old shame and embarrassment. You know, it says something when you, when you decide to cover. Um, so anywho, let's look at it. Let's go look at the passage again. I'm not going to re-preach the message that I preached. I'll, again, I'll put the link for that message in the description, but let's just look at it because I want to speak plainly. Uh, here. And I actually think the scriptures speak really, really plainly. So you should be able to see uh, this text of scripture on your screen. And it typically starts in verse two. Uh, but verse one says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And then as we get into the next verse, it says, now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. That word ordinances is often translated uh, traditions, uh, but at any rate, these were precepts laid down by the apostles in the early church. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. For, the, for if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for the woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely? Is it proper that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man hath long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman let have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given to her for a covering. But if any man seem contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now, in a straight reading, in a, in a straight reading, that is not hard to understand the thrust of that passage. The apostle is laying out this doctrine of, of propriety and worship and how we ought to approach God as it relates to the covering. Uh, it should be noted that this was a uniquely Christian practice, even in this day, that men should be uncovered and that women should be covered when they pray and prophesy. And so it's not actually hard to understand when you just read it, because it's, it's pretty clear. Uh, let's look at it from... 
another translation that you know demonstrates the clarity this is the new living translation which is a translation that i actually appreciate starting again at verse two i am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings i passed on to you but there is one thing i want you to know the head of every man is christ the head of the woman is the man the head of christ is god a man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying but a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head, for this is the same as, as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping, for man is, the, is, <clears throat> man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory, and woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for the woman, but woman was made for the man. For this reason, and because, of the angels, because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right? for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head. Isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? But it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this and neither do God's other churches. So this was actually pretty clear and it was clear for a long time um, again, somewhere around the 1950s or 60s in the women's movement time frame, the doctrine fell away. And so I taught it. And, uh, and you know, to this day, when we have people come into our church, they might see uh, some women covered, uh, not, not every, not even uh, most, but they may see that. And uh, I'd like to make this video just to have a place to point them and say, hey, here's the original sermon. Here's why we do it. This isn't, uh, we're not Muslims. Uh, we're, not, <laughs> we're not opposed to women. We're just asking the women to do what the men do, which is obey this text. Now, there are two primary reasons why, why people don't believe that this text is actually referring to a, a covering, the, an actual covering on the head. The first one is cultural. And, and this is the one that, well, it's probably 50-50. I was going to say the first one's cultural. The second one is he's referring to hair. Uh, but the, the, if he was referring to hair, then, of course, men would have to shave their heads, right? And so uh, he's not referring to hair. The, if we look at the verse down in verse 15, hair is actually one of the reasons, the fact that God has given women longer hair than men is actually one of the reasons that demonstrate that she needs a covering, not the other way around. It's the only way the passage makes sense. If you, if you, if you go back up to verses five and six, every woman that prayer the prophesied with her head uncovered, if that meant without hair, then he goes on to say, then she should shave her head. Well, she didn't have any hair. I mean, so it doesn't make any sense. So no, no. So the hair one is the second one, but you hear that a lot. The first one on uh, this first area of cultural is probably the one that that I hear most now uh, because the second one obviously doesn't make any sense. So the first one is, it was cultural. And so the way the story goes is that this text was given to the church at Corinth only because in Corinth there were these prostitutes, these temple prostitutes. And besides that, uh, somewhere nearby on an island, there were a whole bunch of other, I guess, short-haired, uncovered prostitutes, right? And, um, you know, people are debating that. But here, here's what I have to say about that. I don't care if there were a billion prostitutes in Corinth. The, it, pro, Corinth could have had a woman, lesbian, prostitute mayor, it doesn't change the fact that that is not what the Holy Spirit put in the text. It's just not in there. And so for those of you that are laying this, this uh, text down or aside saying, well, you know, Paul was really addressing a local custom uh, or local issue because there were prostitutes everywhere. Well, just where was that in the Bible? Like, where is that in the context of what he's describing? 
could the Holy Spirit not have said, hey, cover your heads, Corinthian Christians, because we don't want you to be mistaken for a prostitute? Well, that's just not in there. And so for those of you who are saying, I mean, look at the reasons that are given. In my opinion, there are four or five in here. Um, for those of you who are saying that uh, this text should be laid aside because of what was going on in Corinth at the time. Well, if you apply that same hermeneutic across the board, then we're going to lay a lot of the New Testament aside, one. But two, what you're advocating for is a laying aside of a biblical text where we are given specific reasons for a practice because of something not in the text itself. We're going outside of the Bible to disobey something in the Bible. Again, there could have been prostitutes everywhere. That's not the point because he didn't tell us that. So he, if you go back to the text, right, he talks about this being an ordinance and he, he lays it out for us um, in verse two that it's, it's an ordinance. But then in verse three, he starts to deal with God's governmental order. That's a reason that for this practice, the governmental order of God, the headship order of God in verse three. So that's a reason. Then it has nothing to do with context. Those things are still, those things are still true. If we walk a little further, and we go down to verses seven, eight, and nine, we see the creation order of God, right? We see, it takes us back to Genesis, and that has nothing to do with the culture. If you go a little further in verse 10, he talked about the angels. Well, there's a warfare element. There's a spiritual warfare or a spiritual element attached to this. A woman ought to uh, to have power on her head because of the angels. So he, this isn't a suggestion. This is something going on. And, and the angels, uh, that has nothing to do with, with culture. They're, these things are still true. We're still fighting a, a desperate spiritual war, as a matter of fact. If you go a little further, and uh, and he says, uh, you know, judging yourself, is it coming that a woman praying to God with her head uncovered? Doth, doth not nature now he appeals to just the way God created a thing. He appeals to nature. He, he created men with shorter hair, women with longer hair, and uses that as a reason to say, since women typically have longer hair and men shorter, men should not be covered and women should be covered. Even her hair, even her hair shows you that it should be covered. And oh, by the way, the Bible says that her hair is her glory, right? Her long hair is her glory or hair is her glory. Well, doesn't it make sense to veil or cover glory in the presence of God as opposed to showcase it. So anyway, and then finally, he took, he appeals to the normative church practice. If any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. And, uh, and so the truth of the matter is this was a standard practice throughout all the churches, not just Corinth, just like Corinth, the, the letter to the Corinthians was not just written to Corinth, but it was, as Paul says several times in this very letter, and I'll put those verses in the description, but he says many times in this very letter that Corinth was, these, these words were not just written to Corinth, but to all churches. And these were practices that he taught in every church. So yeah, it's, <laughs> it's I don't know if I've explained it very well, but, but, uh, but this, is, this is not that hard. It was, it was not that hard in your grandmother's time, if you're my age, or your mother's time, if you're my age, your grandmother's time, your great-grandmother's time. And oh, by the way, it's not that hard now for men everywhere, because men take their hats off when they come into the presence of God, when they're doing anything solemn, when they bow their heads to prayer, even outside the church, men remove their hats, because it's disrespectful and dishonorable for them to keep their hats on. Well, likewise, um, it's disrespectful and dishonorable for a woman to pray and prophesy with her head uncovered. That's what the Bible says. So if you're in our church, uh, watch the sermon again. I actually even wrote a little book on this, a little shameless plug, uh, that you can find on my website. I'll put that link in the description too. But I wrote a little book on it, not because I'm trying to make money on it, because you're not going to make money on a book on head covering. But so there's a resource to defend the practice uh, so that we have an opportunity to share the gospel with people. In other words, you know, people come in our church and they see some sisters covering and it's, it catches them so off guard that they, they think they wandered into this, uh, you know, twilight zone kind of place. What did I go and where am I? And so we just want to see we're just a regular old Protestant uh, church, soul of scripture type group of folk that believe in all the essentials of the historic Christian faith, the triune uh, Godhead, the deity of Christ, the, 
the 66 books of, of the Bible, uh, salvation by, by grace alone through faith in Jesus Christ alone, right? The, uh, you know, the doctrine of the church, the doctrine of the family. I mean, there's nothing, you know, crazy going on. We just decided, at least a few of us have decided that, that these verses uh, mean what they say they mean. And it's not hair and it's not culture. <laughs> it's just not there. So uh, again, for those of you who still disagree, it's good. It's good. We are, this isn't a fuss fight, but I, I do feel the need to at least have some things out there and on record so that you give our church a chance and so that, uh, so that you know that we're just trying to obey the Bible. That's it. Just want to obey the heart of God. So uh, there is a book available if you want it. Uh, I, the, the head covering website's out there too. There's a wonderful web, website on head covering if you search on it. Um, Headcovering.com, I think, uh, but it, I may not, I'll put that link out there too. Uh, the uh, originator, originator of that website a, is a brother of mine, good good guy. And uh, so I probably messed up the URL, but I'll put the link in, in the description. Check that out. Uh, but again, when it's all said and done and you go, I disagree. Cool. You're welcome in our church. You're welcome to be a part of our church. Uh, you're welcome to participate in the ministries of our church. Uh, Christ and him crucified is our primary message. And again, this defense is just there to just try to keep the devil out <laughs> because uh, because this there is something, you know, to this doctrine. This is the last thing I'll say and then I'll stop. People say it's a small thing. Yeah, compared to the gospel, it is most certainly a small thing. No question about it. However, the level of animosity, warfare, fussing and fighting and carrying on around it suggests that maybe there's more going on here than meets the eye just food for thought. Thanks, guys. I uh, hope that was clear enough and plain enough. And um, next time around, um, uh, I'll see you then. And we'll probably be talking about discipling children and, and, and some of the things surrounding that. So love you guys and praying your best in the Lord.